Today we are wrapping up the series that we began on the first Sunday of this year called Better Than Improved. Can you believe it? We're already five Sundays into the new year. Well, Better Than Improved is just one of the many, many series that we are doing as part of Core 52, where over the course of the year, we are looking at 52 key passages in the Bible, 52 core verses of Scripture that will help us with the big picture of God's story, of the work that He began in creation, of, the, of His plan to restore what was broken at the fall, uh, of His invitation to us and our part in that plan. Now, by making the most of this series, and that involves taking advantage of several different elements, including listening to the sermons, reading the chapters from the book, watching the videos provided by the author of the book that we post online each week for each chapter that we're reading, memorizing the verses each week, studying each chapter with a small group. You take advantage of all of those resources and you're going to have a better sense of what the Bible is all about, the big picture of Scripture and how to apply it, live it out in your life. Now, speaking of the memory verses... I want, to, I want to try and recite the, the five memory verses of this series, Better Than Improve. It kicked off on the first Sunday of the year with Romans 12, 2, which tells us, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The second Sunday was Romans 8, 1, which says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That was followed by the next week, Proverbs 1, 7, which tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And then Psalm 1, chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. And today we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, which says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That little exercise, preparing for that little exercise, doing that for you right now, I got to admit, caused me a fair amount of anxiety. What if I don't get the verses right? What if the people think I I I'm a fraud? Parents are going to want to steer their children uh, clear of me. Uh, maybe I'll even lose my job. Cindy and I could end up homeless. Nobody is going to love me anymore. Clearly, I had a lot riding on getting those verses just right. But isn't that how anxiety works? It just sends you down a rabbit hole of despair. I mean, think about just one thing from this past week that caused you anxiety. Maybe it was a teenager who didn't get home when they were supposed to get home. Where did your mind go on that one? Maybe it was a rumbling about changes at work in your department. Where does your mind go with that? Maybe it was a rumbling in your car. Your car started making a weird noise. Is it the transmission? Where does your mind go? Maybe it was hearing in the news about the ways that the virus is mutating with some variants potentially resistant to the vaccines. Where's your mind going on that one? You know, anxiety just sucks the joy out of living, doesn't it? But part of the reason we get anxious is that sometimes bad things do happen. And what then? I mean, people we love do die. Cars sometimes need repair that far exceeds what we can afford. Jobs do get terminated. And yet, despite those possibilities, and thousands more like them, the Bible tells us, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In a fallen, broken world, where things can and do go wrong, even for Christ followers, how can the Apostle Paul command us to not be anxious about 
anything? Sounds like somebody who doesn't know uh, what difficulty is. That sounds like something somebody would say who's never been sick a day in their life. It sounds like something somebody would say who has never known financial difficulty. Sounds like something somebody would say who is just sitting high in the saddle. But that's not the Apostle Paul, certainly not when he's writing this letter. At the time that he writes this letter to the church in Philippi, Paul is in prison. Based upon what we read about him elsewhere, he's not especially healthy. We know he's not rich. And at this point, he doesn't even know if he's going to live or if he's going to be put to death. Those are a lot of things to be anxious over. And yes, and yet he says, do not be anxious about anything. How is it possible that someone who is so clearly on the bottom sound like somebody who is on the top of it all? Well, Paul can say these words. Paul can tell us to not be anxious about anything because he himself has learned the secret to be content in all things. And that secret has nothing to do with the quality of his circumstances, but everything to do with Jesus Christ. We find our answer to the secret of Paul's contentment earlier in the letter. If you flip back to Philippians chapter 2 of your Bibles, Paul quotes an early church hymn about Jesus that concludes with these words. When he, talking about Jesus, appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name that is above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus secured for us victory over sin and over the grave, a victory that we could never achieve, that we could never win for ourselves. And as a result of that victory, those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, we are now citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. That means that no matter what happens in this life, no matter how it looks in this life now, we, those who belong to Jesus Christ, are a victorious people. We are already citizens of heaven. And on that day when Christ returns, we will rise up and celebrate for the rest of eternity the victory that was already won for us when Jesus himself walked out of the grave three days after being crucified on the cross for our sins. Victory, then, is, our, is already ours. So let's live like it. That's the point of what Paul is saying when he says, do not be anxious about anything. Live victoriously because you are. And that's how Paul lived. He lived like someone who was victorious all the time. And, and again, in Christ, he is. And he shows us in chapter 4 of his letter to the Philippians how to live that same way. He's going to show us that victorious living, however, requires a choice on your part, on our part, to live according to the new reality of who we are in Jesus Christ. It's kind of like a, a person who has had knee replacement or, or hip replacement. The, the surgery is done. Everything's gone well. The body has accepted the knee or the new hip, whatever it is. But to experience the benefit of that new knee or of that new hip, what does the recipient have to do? They, they've got to exercise it, right? They've got to rehabilitate it, right? They've got to use it. They've got to put it into motion. They, they just can't lay on their bed and expect to experience the benefit of that new joint. Well, in the same way, we must engage in the victory that Christ has won for us in order to enjoy its benefit. That's what Paul means by the words that he says in chapter 2 when he says, work hard to show the results of your salvation 
obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. So living victoriously cannot be done passively. It requires active engagement on your part, on my part. And that's so true when it comes to living victoriously over anything that might cause us anxiety. So here's our part. Here's your part. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, Paul goes on to say, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received from me or seen in me, put it into practice, Paul says, and the God of peace will be with you. So to, to break down what Paul has just said, to live victoriously over anxiety means you, you must, first of all, clarify the win, clarify the win in your life. Now that saying I know is pretty cliche. We hear it in the business world, all that. Clarify the win. But it is still good, sound counsel, because if you don't know what the win is, you're liable to find yourself pursuing lesser wins, which are really distractions from the ultimate, from the real win. Well, what's the win for the Christian, for the Christ follower? Is, is a win, is the win an easier life? Or is a win, is the win answered prayer? Is the win that we are pursuing uh, church like the way you want it? Is the win the church is to be pursuing political power, political influence? Is that the win that we're to be building our lives around? Or, or is the win recognition for personal faithfulness, for personal generosity, for, for your service to the church? Is that what the win is? Now, I offer those as suggestions of what wins are that Christians might pursue because those are the things I've seen over the course of a lifetime that many Christians, including myself, often perceive as the wins to pursue in our lives. Well, what happens when those wins don't materialize? What do I do when my life gets hard? Well, I get discouraged. What about when my prayers aren't answered? Well, I get frustrated. What happens when, when church isn't the way that I like it? Well, I, I, I get gnarly. What happens when my tribe loses influence politically? I get scared. What, what about when I don't get my due for all I've done on behalf of the church? I pull back. I get bitter. I get jealous of those who are receiving recognition that I think is due me. And in none of those scenarios, however they play out, do I feel like rejoicing? Why not? Because I'm not getting the wins that I've been pursuing. Well, could it be that maybe those aren't the wins we are to be pursuing as Christ followers? In fact, maybe we're not supposed to be pursuing a win at all. Maybe the win that really allows for rejoicing always is a win that's already been won, been won for us. Not something we pursue, something that's already been won for us. And that win that has already been won comes through Jesus Christ. Look again at what he's won for us. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through what he accomplished on the cross and through his resurrection from the grave that wins for us citizenship in heaven. The win he wins for us is a win that cannot be taken away regardless of the suffering we might face in this life, regardless of the prayers that sometimes may not be answered in the way that we're hoping. It's, it's a win that cannot be taken away regardless of, of the imperfections of our churches. It's a win that cannot be taken away regardless of our weakened political position. It's a win that can be rejoiced in, celebrated 
even when others are celebrated when you're overlooked. No, instead in Christ, we can rejoice always because in Christ we are always winners no matter what. In Christ, we are victorious over sin, over guilt, over shame, over estrangement from God, even over death itself. We are victorious. However, all of that is only a win if you realize there is nothing better in this world than knowing and being known by Jesus Christ. Paul knew that to be true, and that's why he says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. How about you? Have you discovered that the grace of our, of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that the love of God, that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, have you discovered those things to be better by far than anything this world has to offer? If so, if that's what you believe, then you know what it is to be victorious. Even if, from the world's perspective, there's very little that's envious about your life. Except, except, maybe, the joy that is so apparent within you, regardless of what might be going on around you or even to you. How is that possible? Well, you know how it's possible, right? In knowing what matters most, you have clarified the win. You know that in Jesus Christ, you are loved beyond measure. You are forgiven as far as the East is from the West. You have an inheritance in Him that will never perish or spoil or fade. No wonder you are a rejoicing kind of person and always rejoicing kind of person. Well, not only do those who live in victory rejoice always, they also, they don't sweat the small stuff or even the big stuff. Now, that is not to say that we pretend as if our problems and our struggles aren't real. After all, how often does Scripture encourage us to encourage each other, to carry each other's burdens, to pray for one another, to help each other? to even grieve with each other. That doesn't sound like advice given to people who are to pretend that they don't struggle. No, we do struggle, but we lean on each other in those times. Even still, though, because of the win, because of the victory that we have in Christ, the momentary problems of this life, they don't overwhelm us. They don't derail our faith. They don't throw us off of our game. Now, if you're a football fan, you probably watched last week's game between the Green Bay Packers and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the winner of whom goes to the Super Bowl being played next week. Well, as many of you know, the quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers is a former longtime quarterback for the Patriots, Tom Brady, 43 years old, the winner of six Super Bowls. But in last week's game, he threw three interceptions. That is not good. That is not how you win games. You throw three interceptions on three consecutive possessions like he did, and most people would start to worry. They would start getting anxious, but Tom Brady did not. It looked bad, but Brady has a winner's mindset. He didn't sweat those interceptions. He kept focused on the game, and his team won. In fact, in the four games that Tom Brady has thrown three interceptions, his team has gone on to win three of those games. You know, sometimes your life looks like one interception after the other, one fumble after another, one blindside tackle after another. But in Christ, remember this, you are still victorious. And because we are victorious in those moments of stress, in those moments of strife, in those moments of crisis, in those moments of brokenness, we, we do grieve but not as those who have no hope. And, and yeah, we can be open about our sorrow, about our pain, and yet we still hold tight to our faith all the same. And yeah, we, we continue to strive toward better outcomes, but we continue to trust even if the outcomes that we're 
pursuing don't work out the way that we imagined they would. And so in every loss and every struggle and every broken dream, we, we keep leaning into God upon the everlasting arms of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the first chapter of Philippians of this letter, Paul is very open about the uncertainty surrounding his future. He may be freed one day or he may end up dying a martyr's death. But in his mind, because he is in Christ, it is win, win, either way. So he's not sweating the outcome. He writes, I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ. And dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ which would be better by far for me, but for your sakes, it's better that I continue to live. What's throwing off your game right now? What has you rattled? What's causing you anxiety in your life? Go to God. Pray to God. In everything, take it to Jesus. Let him envelop you with his love with his peace, and know this, he doesn't love you less when you're anxious, when you've become unsettled, or when you're struggling, or even because you're stumbling. In fact, it could be argued that in those moments, he's drawn to you even more. In 1651, Puritan preacher Thomas Goodwin wrote in his book, The Heart of Christ, these words, about the heart of Christ toward the struggling follower. He says, Jesus suffers with us under our infirmities, and by infirmities are meant sins, as well as other miseries. Christ takes part with you and is so far from being provoked against you as all his anger is turned upon sin to ruin it. Yes, his pity is increased the more towards you, even as the heart of a father is to a child that has some loathsome disease. If you have called upon Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've been buried and raised up with him in baptism, there is no reason to sweat the small or even the big stuff of this life because Jesus is with you. Lean into him and keep on leaning. But in order for our lives to be truly shaped by the victory Christ has won for us, we must learn to think like a winner. You know, typically, winners aren't winners just because they're lucky. No, it's because they're different. And part of the reason they're different is because of their mindset. They're not easily rattled. They're not easily foiled. They're not easily discouraged. Instead, they think differently. They process things differently. Well, the gospel is to have that same kind of impact, that same kind of uh, rewiring of our brain in our lives. It's to shape how we think. That's one of the memory verses that we had for this series, Better Than Improved. Again, do not be conformed to this world but be renewed by the transforming of your mind that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Because of the win then, of the gospel in our lives, the very wiring of our brains changes. Your Core 52 book, the, the chapter, chapter 48, even talks about that process, what happens. You know, you want to live out the reality of the victory that you have in Jesus Christ, then you have to think like someone who is victorious in Jesus. And what does that mean? It means choosing to think about those things that are true, that are noble, that are right, that are pure, that are lovely, that are admirable, that are excellent, that are praiseworthy. And on the flip side, it means expelling from or not even allowing into our minds in the first place anything that is false, or dishonorable, or wrong, or impure, or abominable, or base, or not praiseworthy at all. And if it's hard for you to envision 
that kind of person, that kind of thinking, that kind of mentality, follow Paul's advice in verse 9 and find someone who does think like a victor in Christ thinks and learn from that person. Watch that person. Model them. And as you do, you're going to experience more and more in your life what they are experiencing in their lives, which is what? The peace of God. You know, those who are at peace, even as the world rages around them, are the true victors. And the world sees it. The world takes notice. You're looking at one of my favorite pictures of my two granddaughters, Eliza, who's the, the baby, the younger one, and Margo, who just turned four in, Dece in December. Now, uh, Eliza is looking at Margo with an expression to, that to me says, what in the heck are you so happy about, you know? Well, the more we internalize and live out the re reality of the victory that we have in Christ, I think there's going to be more and more people in the world who look at us with that same kind of expression that Eliza is looking at Margo with that says, what in the heck are you so happy about? That's a good question. But it's a question we are eager to answer. Because we want the win that Christ won for us to be the same win that he's won for them as well. This past week, my wife and I listened to that football game on the radio as we were driving home. And at the end of the game, the announcer had said something about a muted celebration. And my wife asked, what's he mean, muted celebration? And I said, well, think about it, COVID, the, the players can't gather closely together on the field and, and celebrate. You know, church, we don't want to have a muted celebration. We want to have a celebration that's as full as it can be with every person that Christ died for taking part in the celebration. And the more you live out the victory of Jesus Christ in your life, the more you live out victory over anxiety, the more people are going to see that joy, that peace in your life and want to know and want to receive what you have. What an opportunity, church. Let's be ready. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we do thank you for the peace that transcends understanding, for the joy that perseveres regardless of what we might face in this life. Lord, I know we are not immune from struggle or trial or heartache. And we thank you, God, that you do hear our prayers and you, you grieve with us and, and you respond to our tears. And yet, because of the victory we have in your Son, Jesus Christ, we know that not only will we overcome, but we have already overcome. And so we are able to maintain joy even through wet eyes. Oh, dear God, I pray that we are a faithful church, a church that is faithful to living out the victory that is won in such apparent ways that others want to know what is so different about us. And when they ask, that we be ready to share the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. I'd like for you to stick around for a few moments for these announcements because we have a couple of big announcements for you. But first of all, if you're ready to take a next step, you'd like to reach out to the church, maybe ask some questions about the church, about membership, about baptism, about becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, just text the word NEXT to the number 812-390-4540 and we will follow up with you right away. We would love to make a connection with you. Also, if you're watching this during the 10 a.m hour, be sure to stick around for the discussion questions. We've got a Zoom uh, meeting opportunity hosted by Tyler Tolbert, our Minister of Discipleship and Outreach. Well, next Sunday, February 7th, we're going to return to in-person services. At the 9 a.m. hour, that service is for people 65 and older. We're trying to be sensitive to that age group uh, for obvious reasons. And then at 1030, the service is open to all others. We'll be returning to family life ministries and activities uh, in a few weeks, but at least for next week, beginning next week, we'll have worship service in 
person. Now, we're going to still offer the online worship opportunity. And about that, there's going to be a whole new platform that we're going to be using called Church Online. This just allows us to reach and connect with more people. Now, to access that, you can go to www fccoc.org backslash live and you will be able to find access to it. If you have any questions or problems, just contact the church office and we'll get you the information that you need. Now, for those of you who are able to join with us next week in person, you're going to notice some big changes to the facility. You're going to see improved lighting, some kiosks, clear signage, digital visuals, changes in the children's ministry area, and one big change is a makeover of the Lafayette Street lobby. Now, why all of those changes and with more still to come? Well, a big reason is, is because we want our facility to be more welcoming to and accommodating to first-time guests. We want our first-time guests to know that we are looking forward to them coming. We are expecting them to come. We are looking forward to their families joining us for worship and any other activity we have going on. We want them to join with us in the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Well, we think you're going to be pretty excited about those changes as well. So be sure to check those out next Sunday, February 7th. Be praying for our services as we prepare for uh, that transition, but we are looking forward to seeing so many of you back in person again. And we'll be practicing safe practices, standing apart by six feet, sanitizing frequently, uh, face masks expected, and certainly everybody take responsibility. So God bless you. Be praying for us. and We'll be praying for you.